So let's start with Ralph. This is a teacher in Berkeley in the 70s, yes. and as you tell in the book, he plays a game of Monopoly with his kids, and right. then that night or the next day, he goes on a bit of a rant about Monopolies. They're terrible, right, they're right, horrible, right. they're awful. And his son says, well, heck, I just want, am I a bad right, person? Right, I just want the right. game. And he goes, yeah, that's a good point. Why the heck do we play a game that celebrates something that's evil? Right, right. And the, what's funny about Ralph is he creates this game called Anti-Monopoly, which you know, as its name implies, is Monopoly backwards. So instead of trying to get control of everything and become a monopolist, you're trying to break things apart. And when he creates this game in the 70s, he doesn't know the history of the game. He thinks like everybody, Darrow invented it during the Great Depression. And by making this game, he's actually returning it to its like anti-capitalist kind of edgier roots. But he has which, no idea. Yeah. He has no idea at the time, which is very funny to me. Um, right, and he, and he creates this game and he originally calls it Trust the Bust. R bust the trust, bust right, the trust, right, right. He which toys is with a few different names. Literally, what it is, and then right. he comes up with the catch your anti monopoly, right? Because he realizes like nobody talks about trust busting the way like, <laughs> they did in Teddy's Teddy Roosevelt's day, unfortunately. And, and he starts to market it locally in San Francisco, is that right? right. Correct. And it does really well. I mean, in the second right. year, he's selling a couple hundred thousand copies. That's pretty damn good for a guy that's hand selling his game. Right. And I think that part of, um, you know, a hit in the board game industry is really rare. But I think part of why anti monopoly did so well is, I mean, think about. Northern California in the early 70s. You know, this this was a very cynical time, and I think the game really spoke to people then. And uh, one of my other rants is about board games. I think that board games right now are kind of in this place that comic books were in a few years ago, where people didn't see them as artifacts of their time. They didn't see them as these, you know, pieces that can tell us about history and the people that were living in them at the time. And so Anti Monopoly, I think, like, fits in that tradition. To me, it's such a game of the 70s, you know, <laughs> and of California. And so it really worked, and Nixon right. was in Watergate, everything right, was anti-establishment, right. it worked right. perfectly, and it was anti-monopoly. Anti, arguably the most popular board game of all time, as far as uh, commercial. modern commercial games. Uh, monopoly or anti-monopoly? Uh, monopoly is. Yes, I think, you know, it's a blockbuster. There's no, Hasbro doesn't um, break out, you know, by game sales, mm -hmm. but I think it's fair to say it's... You know, it's a, it's a huge hit and still, you know, continues to be. You got to go to chess and checkers to sort of yeah. really, and backgammon to really compete with it. Right. And those are in the public domain. So, right. you know, the, the manufacturing implications are different. So, And of course, Monopoly, uh, if we jump back a bit, we're already messing up with the structure. Of the <laughs> but, but Parker Brothers had great success with Tiddlywinks and Ping Pong. Right. But they found those games slipping out of their control. Right. They sort of became part of the public domain or people could make variations right. on right. it right. that were successful. And they're like, ah. And so they have this game, Monopoly, that literally saved their company during the right. Depression and is hugely important to them. And some guys start selling anti-Monopoly and they say, well, that's not cute. And they sue him. Right. And, and they, you know, like a lot of companies went after people that they felt like were infringing. So because of Ralph's lawsuit, we know that Parker Brothers reached out to the makers of Spaceopoly. Um, there was a priest making a game called Theopoly <laughs> who also heard from the company. So, um, but that's like pretty normal for a company to try and assert their claim. And actually courts look at that, you know, if you're trying to defend your mark, did you, how, how consistent have you been? You so it makes sense to. that they would do that, right? Because if you don't, then you've given right, up right. to it. Right, and, the, and also you kind of want to cover the waterfront. I can see why lawyers at Parker Brothers would say, we can't just pick on one guy, you know, that makes a game. We, we need to be kind of keep an eye on this whole. Right, landscape. it's not just because it's right. successful. And that's why you'll find right. out that Disney sort of clamps down and puts up a, sends a lawyerly letter to a little nursery school with pictures of Mickey on the side of the building. Right, right, very similar, yeah. for sure. And so they get embroiled in a lawsuit and it goes on for a long time. It consumes his life, yeah. his wife is ill, gets ill during the time she ends up, we find out having MS, it's, it's hard on their marriage, it consumes everything about them, including all their money. Right. And uh, there's incredibly dramatic stuff in this lawsuit, which goes all the way to the Supreme Court. I mean, right. at one point, he finally, his son stumbles upon this earlier version of Monopoly finds out it looks like Monopoly was not invented by Charles Darrow during the Great right, Depression, right, right. but by this woman called Lizzie Maggie, Maggie, McGee. McGee. And that same day, the lawyer that's been working side by side with him has a heart attack. Right. There's a lot of really dramatic episodes in this. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of people told me that Ralph's story feels very cinematic to them, that he's, you know, I, I think that when you look at stories and you look at kind of your main characters are, and bad things happen to them, you say, you wonder, like, what does this reveal about them? And I had this question about Ralph and his motives all the time. I thought, like, all these things that happened to them, I know so many people who would drop the lawsuit or they would take the settlement or what have you. And understanding his background as a character was really important to me. I mean, I spent a lot of time interviewing him and he left uh, Danzig, you know, right before the Nazis came in. And he, you know, his family are Jewish and he came to the States as an immigrant. 
worked his way through school. Um, and, you know, his son, so I interviewed for the book as well, and um, his late ex-wife, Ruth, they said there was always a cause in the house, like whether it was going against the Vietnam War or whatever. <laughs> so, yeah, so the idea that he was going to fight this to the bloody end surprised me less and less as I kind of started unpacking their family and their dynamic a little bit.